Hi, and welcome to episode 35 of Breaking Bio Podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson. I'm a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. And today we've got a special guest, Phil Torres. But before we get to him, we'll introduce our co-host for today, starting with Bug. Oh, hi, I'm Bug Girl. Uh, I'm hidden away at my secret lair in Ohio. Uh, I'm Heidi Smith. I'm a postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got a very special guest, uh, Phil Torres, who, besides being a modern-day Wallace and an exploration of the Amazon, he's also uh, telling us that he's soon going to be associated with Rice University. So we'll, of course, get into a little bit about that. So, Phil, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes. Hi, guys. My name is Phil Torres, and I am a uh, conservation biologist mostly, and I've been working in the Amazon for the last two years. Uh, I was first in Ecuador for a year, and now I'm based out of Peru. And I uh, get to run around the jungle and call it a job, and it's a pretty good time. Sounds like the best of times, actually. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The best of times. So I, you're – oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, so you're starting your, your PhD soon at Rice. Do you feel like this is almost a formality? Um, you know, I, I love doing what I'm doing so much, and – I've been finding a lot of cool stuff to research, but I would love, I mean, what the PhD is going to offer is just incredible guidance. People I'm working with are just really, really smart, and uh, they're going to be able to just push me in the right direction and make sure that the research I am doing is as good as it needs to be um, and better than I can currently do on my own. And I've been doing a lot of these research projects kind of on my own these last couple of years, and um, I would love for somebody to just tap me on the shoulder and be like, hey, do that thing instead. Uh, just, you know, have uh, being surrounded by smart people is a, is a pretty good thing. And that's kind of what I, I'm anticipating with my PhD. I've gone there and met the people in the labs and they're just all brilliant and like what I'm working on and I've worked on similar things. So it's just going to be a really good opportunity to hone my craft and to get a lot more publications out. Um, I need to spend some time in the U.S. to to do more writing and to do more analysis and it's kind of hard to write and have computer time when you have a generator running like three to five hours a day to charge up your stuff and you know you just there's certain limitations and the internet is like equivalent to like 1999 internet to send a single tweet it takes about 10 minutes sometimes of just reloading yeah. reloading um, so I've become well, we appreciate the effort there. so but if you can imagine that, that does affect uh, productivity. Um, so PhD is a good excuse to just kind of hunker down, have a good base, uh, a place to call home again. I've kind of been homeless, just like bouncing around the U.S. when I am here with my bags. Uh, you know, it's been a very good time, but I, uh, I want to make more out of it. And so I think getting into the uh, academic circle and um, communicating within that circle a bit more will be a good step for me. Yeah. What what portion of your time will you be spending actually in lab and in the United States then as opposed so, to doing field work? Um, it's kind of yet to be determined. The th reason why I chose this program is because I only have to take a couple courses. I only have to TA twice and then the rest of the time I can be in the field. So a lot of other people in this department, um, sometimes like one girl's working in Madagascar, she's out for 11 months of the year on occasion. Um, so, you know, I'll be in the U.S. as much as I can, but what I'm really trying to do is set up a long-term research project in Peru looking at butterfly populations and hire some Peruvian students um, and maybe get some uh, students from the U.S. as well to come down and help run the program so I don't have to be there all the time. Uh, when you set up your new apartment, is it going to be bare bones with a sleeping bag and a lantern, or are you going to make it super posh now that you've had to rough it for so long? Um, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little hesitant to invest too much into a single room at this point. The way that I'm bouncing around, and I've got some other projects I'm working on, so I'll be traveling a lot, and I just, uh, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know how long I will stay in a single apartment, especially if I take off I know by next May I'll be down in Peru again. So if I'm going to be gone for a long time, there's really no point in putting, you know, posh stuff on the wall. Someday, <laughs> I do, I, you know, I do appreciate the posh. I lived in LA for a while. And there's some nice culture there, and uh, 
and good food and restaurants and stuff. But um, as far as investing in my own things, uh, not yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's always, you know, when you have very little, because I just moved, like there's small luxuries mm -hmm. you allow yourself, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but I mean, internet that's past the 90s, that will be huge for you. Oh, my gosh. I know. Doing and, what we're doing right now, it's crazy. <laughs> and really hot showers. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? These guys, I work with the ecotourism company down there. Um, so in Ecuador, I was I was roughing it, and it was it was very challenging conditions. But in Peru, I work with a company called Rainforest Expeditions. Mm -hmm. So I am kind of their in-house naturalist in a way, and I do a lot of their online social media writing, but then they also support my research. So um, I call myself a field biologist, but I'm like the most spoiled field biologist in the world. <laughs> Um, even in this really remote area, I work called the Tambopata Research Center. It takes you two days of canoeing to get out there. It is just a beautiful area, but they uh, recently installed little gas things for each of the showers, so I can have a hot shower. Not that you really wow. get it in the Amazon, but if I uh, so desire after a long night walk, you can have a hot shower, which is, you know, that is, that's not fair. <laughs> um, you know, but I like yeah. to say I've I've done my time in uh, in Ecuador. It was it was uh, pretty rough. We'd have to carry in like 100 pound sacks of food every Friday night, and you know that was that was doing it the hard way. So I figured getting a little bit of, of posh jungle treatment for now is okay, and then I'm sure down the road I'll I'll end up roughing it again. Well, it sounds like you definitely put your time in, so. You deserve perhaps a hot shower now, well, and still call you, yourself man. a, a field biologist because I think it's it's pretty legit. So, um, so a question I've had uh, yeah. is, how did you get into such a hardcore field biology lifestyle? Like you went to Cornell yeah. for your undergrad, and you got into entomology, obviously, and butterflies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to hear your motto before we go too much further along here. <laughs> um, but how did you how did you find yourself spending so much time? in the Amazon, which is, you know, a lot of field or a lot of biologists dream come true. It's, um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, I did, my family would travel when I was a kid, uh, nothing crazy, but I, my dad's family's from Nicaragua and I forced my parents to take me and my sisters out to the jungle there. And so this is when I was 15 and I contacted the head entomologist in Nicaragua and said, Hey, can I have a permit to collect butterflies here? He said, sure. Um, and then, so I got to take them out and we went really remote. So I got like a bit of field experience and I think that kind of helped the conversation in the future and learning Spanish was also very helpful because my first opportunity was at Cornell and a grad student there was doing an expedition to Venezuela and he needed a assistant who was doing entomology, but also could translate for him. So I was the only undergrad at the time that could speak Spanish somewhat. So I got to go with him. And so that was an opportunity that then led to getting recommended for a for field work in Mongolia for my summer job. Um, and for any undergrads out there, look up REUs, Research Experience for Undergrads. That changed my life. Getting that job to, uh, it was based out of Philadelphia, but being able to spend a month in Mongolia in the field, like, that was crazy. Like, that summer job was, it was pretty fun. It wasn't like lifeguarding at the neighborhood pool or something. It was uh, it was really incredible um, experience. So that, that kind of helped, and it also planted the seed in me that I was like, I need to be in the field. Um, and since I was a kid, like, my mom told me I would literally, like, not be able to sleep when I was seven because I would just dream about catching butterflies in the jungle. Um, so, you know, it's uh, – it's been in me for a while, and I've always, I've always wanted to live this kind of life. Um, and then I was working in L.A. for a while, and I just got the itch to get back into the field. I was doing some public science education stuff with the California Science Center, still working with bugs all the time, but just want to get out in the field. And then I saw a job opportunity. Um, they had an application for somebody with uh, field experience in the tropics who spoke Spanish, who's done education stuff and who can, um, who has publications. And I very fortunately happened to fit those categories. And so I remember I saw this um, job ad for managing a field station in Ecuador. And I told my friends, I was like, yeah, I just applied for a job in the middle of Ecuador. And if I get it, I'm going. And, there, and it's a year commitment. And everybody was like, okay, right, you know. Um, but then, uh, you know, I had a couple of interviews. The next thing I knew, I was flying down to Ecuador. And 
um, worked with an organization called GVI, so it's Global Vision International, and they do what's called like volunteerism. So volunteers pay to go there, and then we train them in how to be a field biologist, and there are assistants in the field. Um, so it wasn't the traditional path of you know getting a grant to get this. I just saw an opportunity to really spend a year in the field and um, grow on my own and become a scientist on my own and just kind of create my own research project. And I took that opportunity. And when I was there, I saw um, – a few things. For one, the social media thing works pretty well when you're in the jungle. People like seeing uh, field work. You know, not just the jungle, but just anywhere you're doing field work, people think it's pretty cool. So I could post pictures of boas we were catching or um, cool butterflies or, you know, dead sloths that we would find. Just random stuff. Uh, we found When we found a dead sloth, we posted a picture of me cutting off its head with a machete. Because, you, <laughs> you know, you got to preserve the skull. Um, <laughs> And and did you get any uh, blowback from that? No, people were surprisingly cool with it. We'll see after this, maybe somebody will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we then preserved the school, and we used it for education with the local schools. I mean, these schools, these kids have never seen anything close to a museum. And we made a little tiny museum in um, at our field station, and then we'd bring over some of the kids from the local schools that we would teach at. Um, and these are really remote Amazon schools. So it was a cool opportunity to, and a fun excuse to use a machete on something. Uh, um, but I, uh, I, I saw a lot of opportunities between ecotourism and um, research. So that's been one of the big things that I like to work on. And so I got in touch uh, with this company in Peru, and they basically said, hey, how would you like to come down here and do research and write for us and do our social media type thing. And so I was like, sure, that sounds pretty fun. <laughs> um, so that it was just kind of a, it's not a traditional path, but it was a lot of it was just kind of look, getting the experience early and working hard to get that experience and then just looking for alternate opportunities to just spend time in the jungle and spend time doing some sort of research or outreach thing that is really um, kind of set me up going into my PhD. I feel like I have a really good sense of what my thesis is going to be on, um, where my field site's going to be, how I'm going to do a lot of stuff, and what I need to learn. So I know, like, my statistics really suck. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning all that stuff, you know. Um, but just getting this kind of uh, – doing this kind of thing is, yeah, I don't know. Things fell in a good, good place. That's how it works. That's how it works. You give you set yourself up for the best opportunities, and, and it more often than not works out some way that you don't expect. So that, that's a pretty awesome <laughs> life history to get into a PhD. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Wait. So what's your what's your motto? My motto is um, it's only tough guys catch butterflies. <laughs> well, that's probably the best yeah. motto I've ever heard. So <laughs> I would. Uh, I would teach a lot. Um, so during the training week for volunteers in Ecuador, I would always do a, a talk and walk. So I'd give a little presentation on butterflies, and then I would walk and check some butterfly traps up on the hill. But um, it's pretty easy for like 20-year-old guys or you know 18-year-old girls to just not – I mean, maybe they'll think butterflies are pretty, but not to get that engaged in them. So my trick is I would always just pretend like they're the most dangerous animal in the rainforest. And I would just, you know, make these rules of like, you know, before we go out, like, do not look them in the eye, you guys, okay? <laughs> Very serious. Um, don't trust anything they tell you. Um, you know, we've got an anti-venom kit in case one touches you. So just, you know, just make a little cut it out and then suck the blood out and you'll be fine. Uh, so just kind of building it up as this, like, thing. And then you could kind of make believe – that you're going on this really big adventure and then that kind of plays into learning about them and people loved it. It was a really fun opportunity just to, um, I love teaching in the field. It's the best learning environment possible because you can read something in a book and then you look up and it's right there. So, so many of our students did so well and um, went on to work in like wildlife conservation programs or to go to university for it. Um, so yeah, so that's how tough guys catch butterflies. Uh, <laughs> came in just one day when I was talking about it. Just I was like, I like this. I gotta stick with it. It's good. I like it. It's pretty awesome. I mean, you do have the tough guy cred though, because uh, 
I gotta, you I gotta bring you this up. Machete. You have a machete. That's yeah, you got a machete. You've decapitated a dead sloth with a machete. Hey, so hey, that, hey! I would like to point good. out, someone here has been training in a martial art that uses machetes for 20 years. No way. So, you know... We're surrounded by badasses, just, then. Surrounded by just bad. pointing this out. That's Except for me and Morgan. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pocket knife, that's it. Um, <laughs> I don't even have that. <laughs> But some of your other your badass cred comes from the fact that you've lived through the experience of having a spitting cobra actually hit you in the eyes. Yes. Yeah. Um, wow. So that was uh, interesting. Um, I uh, so I do some some TV stuff. Um, I really like doing big science communication, and I think uh, you know Twitter and social media is a really good avenue, but also television because you can literally reach millions of people by shooting for three days and then it goes on and they can just keep playing it. So um, I did a pilot for Animal Planet um, that was called The Pain Gang and it was basically like Mythbusters meets Jackass. And so we were <laughs> at, uh, I don't know we if you looking... know this, but Animal Planet used to have stories about animals on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like yes. a long yeah. time ago. I've, I've heard about And them. real animals, you know, I not know. just the mermaids. I know, right? <laughs> I don't, even, don't even get me started. but Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, I, uh, we'll just assume that dead horse has been flogged and move on. <laughs> Continue, yes, please. Yes. <laughs> um, so we um, basically we were testing out what remedies actually work to uh, if you get spitting cobra venom in your eye because in textbooks it literally says to use beer, milk, or urine because that's pretty much all people have in the bush um, in Africa. And so we we're like, okay, you know, let's get to the bottom of this. Like, what really is the best one? And we had the world's leading expert on spitting cobras and uh, two venom experts there. And everybody was like, oh, you know what? This dose you're getting, you're just going to have to pretend. It's not even going to be that bad. Um, so they actually, like, strap us into the scary-looking chair and then put a drop of diluted venom um, in my eyeball. And... The guy who went before me is about 350 pounds, ex-biker dude. He's been shot. He's been stabbed. And he was in the most pain of his life. And I was like, here's a little old me. I get this next. And um, so, yeah, it was the most painful thing I've experienced. It felt like holding a lighter up to your eyeball. Ah, oh, jeez. You can Jesus. imagine that. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, um, it was cool. At one point, we, all, we had a spitting cobra on the opposite end of a table, and we had goggles on, and we got to dodge it spitting at us. <laughs> So like that was that alone. I was like, all right, it's totally worth it. Um, <laughs> uh, this eyeball wow. still acts up sometimes, and yeah. it, this contact Speaking dries out. That, I don't still, know if that's badass or that's. I don't stupid. know if that's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, stupid. I don't want to say it. I was it's going. a reasonable word, you know. But I. You know, <laughs> you know, really cool. Said, but what did your parents say about this? Because um, if you were my kid, I would have been losing my mind. You know, they don't know a lot of the details of it. <laughs> so hopefully, they don't watch this. Um, you know, but I, uh, you know, I think it's it's as a, if I was just a random person, I don't think I would have done it. But as a scientist, I thought, you know what? There's something to be learned here, and there's actually by putting really snake good. venom in your eye. Yes. <laughs> So no, if you look up on PubMed, if you look for spitting cobra venom, like the best uh, paper on it is from the recovery of my eyeball. Um, so now. <laughs> so oh well, you got a publication out of it. Well, that's totally fine. Yeah. That's fine yes. though. That's totally. You got Psycom and a pub. That's I'm like not, superstar. That's, that's totally yeah. badass. This is this is badass. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. As long as you got a publication out of it, it's all good. That's right. That's right. There's a the herpetologist at the museum in North Carolina in Raleigh. He, during his PhD as a master's, did work on spitting cobras. This was before there were rules about torturing graduate students. Mm. And his project was literally most, like spitting cobra, and he wore a face shield with the eyes cut out, and he let the snake spit at him. And then they would score where the where it went, how the spit went. That's how, cool. That's the worst. But he's like, oh, yeah, you know, that was my research project. Like, that's horrible. It was, yeah, I don't recommend anybody mess with them because it was very, very painful. Um, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And this is how you get the butterflies collecting is only for tough guys. That's Monica, right. So. You know, I had to go through a lot. And, <laughs> and my other thing with that is when people were like, be like scared of something or, you know, feel weak, I'd be like, you know what? You haven't been catching a lot of butterflies lately. 
you know, you should really, if you catch more butterflies, you'll just get tougher. There's, there's a direct correlation, and then you can handle all this. Uh, you have to power up. You got to power up on both. <laughs> That's, right. That's, right. That's awesome. So you, getting back to the jungle and away from bodily harm a little bit. Yes. Um, <laughs> Don't do that at home, kids. Please. Yeah. Exactly. Or anywhere. Or, or anywhere. Or anywhere. Or adults. Yeah. Adults, kids, don't do this at all. Unless you're trained like Phil. But even then, probably don't do it. No. Um, <laughs> so back in the Amazon and your social media, and you said shooting, taking all sorts of stuff and putting it out there on social media, you've had a lot of success in the last six months bringing some of the cool stuff that's in the Amazon to the people and getting a lot of media attention. Um, in particular, what I'm calling the Trojan spider, um, the spider that makes you know, the faker spider in the middle of its web. We'll have you talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit. And then the infamous Donald Trump caterpillar, yes. which <laughs> has gone all crazy kind of viral online. Yeah. Um, what are your experiences with that? <clears throat> you know, it's something that I've, uh, yeah, I don't know what it is, but the internet apparently likes weird things in the Amazon. So I'm trying to uh, just kind of run with that because it's a great way of reaching a lot of people and then, um, and it's a form of education, even if it's as silly as like Donald Trump's wig, um, it's still, you know, people read that and then they're like, oh, there's caterpillars that look like that and they have spiny hairs that hurt if you touch them and it makes them think about a bug. And if I can get people to think about bugs, then that's a, that's a little win. Um, but yeah, that one in particular just kind of blew my mind because I just, I just took a picture of it and I put it on Facebook and put it on Twitter and then somehow um, people started, it happened multiple times that individuals started comparing it to Donald Trump's wig and then it got on Reddit and it got like 1.6 million views in about five days or something. Um, wow. Maybe even more than that. But it was a, a crazy amount of views pretty quickly and then um, it got shared on IFing Love Science, it got shared on all these other things and um, and then finally a news organization approached us and said, hey, can we make it like an official like press release that Donald Trump's wig has been discovered in the Amazon? And I was like, sure, <laughs> let's do it. Um, so I got to like put in some quotes and, and make some like real information out of it. And, uh, and then <clears throat> um, it got picked up in like Discovery News and – um, it was talked about on MSNBC late night with Jimmy Fallon, did a little joke on it. Um, so it's just the weirdest thing. I'm like, it was just a little picture I took of a caterpillar. I was really excited when I saw the thing because I had I had seen pictures of them before but never actually seen one. And it was just a little, like, point shoot. We had all these guys with these, like, fancy cameras trying to get the perfect shot of it. And I was just like, click, and then that was the one. <laughs> um, so it's uh, – it's a bizarre world out there connecting the Amazon to um, to the Internet. But, uh, yeah, we've had some – another one we just had was a picture of um, these turtles with um, about 20 butterflies all on its face. And it looks like it's wearing, like, a butterfly mask, which is one of the most bizarre – like, everybody's just like, oh, it must be Photoshop, it must be Photoshop. But it's – it's a thing that happens down there is that butterflies feed on the salt in turtle tears. But this one in particular was just smothered. And it was kind of like adorable because the turtle just looked like helpless. But it was <laughs> covered in these bright butterflies everywhere. Um, so that was another one that, that got out there that uh, seemed to go pretty well and get some good attention on the Internet and made people learn. So. No, I think it's great. I, I, I love that you're, you're taking it directly from – the Amazon, not even hours after you found these things sometimes, and they're going mm -hmm. viral online or, or getting a lot of people talking about some of the cool shit that's in the, in the Amazon, mm -hmm. which they really need to know because, like you said, it, it's just fascinating stuff. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's been an interesting kind of dilemma or something I have to think about. Like, for instance, with the, the spider, um, so you know that spider that it makes a big fake spider in its web, which is pretty cool. Um, it, uh, you know, I could have gone the route of making a publication and it would have taken a lot of time to do that. But um, instead, I just kind of went public with it. And I was like, hey, this cool thing exists and I'm still studying it. Um, so I uh, then got contacted by Wired and Wired Magazine, uh, Wired Science was really the one that, that blew up that article um, and got that thing to go pretty viral. 
on the internet, which was cool. But when I talked to some professors about it, they were just like, you know, that was a little non-traditional what you did there. And I was just like, well, you know, the people learn about it, and my name's still kind of associated with it, and I am doing publications on it, and we've got a lot of work to do to understand it because it's just there's so many questions you could ask when it comes to how and why and how hereditary and all these things with with this uh, formation that the spider is able to make. Um, but I thought it was um, – I would rather just kind of let the world know about these things as they happen because I think that allows people to connect more with the researcher. Um, and I'm not doing that for everything. There's a couple things I'm working on right now that I'm kind of waiting for the publication. But other stuff, as I find them, I'm just kind of like putting them out there and just being like, hey, world, this exists. And it creates conversation. I learned a lot um, from Twitter because I had no idea – if that spider making spider existed, um, if somebody had seen that behavior before. So I wrote some researchers and then, um, and they hadn't really heard of it and I put it out on Twitter and I got a response from one example um, that wasn't quite the same. So I was just like, well, tell the world and see what happens. Yeah, I think there are enough species out there that we can all do our own things. Mm -hmm. Also, by putting it out there, you've kind of got dibs anyway. <laughs> And other people, like other ecologists, should be, I mean, I think they are really excited. Uh, I want to know, what's your favorite butterfly? Um, my favorite butterfly, it was probably, um, probably this one, it's called Napiogenes Tolosa Mombachuensis. Um, you know, that one. So it's found on one volcano. <laughs> oh, in that Canada. one, yeah. You know. um, but it was one that I had caught when I was 15 uh -huh. and visiting Nicaragua. Then I got sent an article saying this was like a newly described subspecies that was only found there, and they'd only had like two specimens of it. And I was like, hey, I have one of these. And it was <laughs> cool that I was like a 15-year-old, and I had a specimen of something that like some of the top researchers only had two of them, and I felt pretty cool. And I was just like, <laughs> I can actually make a difference. And so that butterfly to me was always kind of symbolic that um, you're never too young, you're never too inexperienced or whatever, just – go out and try to do cool things and look for interesting stuff and you can make a discovery. Why entomology is the best. So much left yes. to discover. So True. Much. So much. True. You can make, it, you uh, can make differences non, anywhere. I'm the only non-ento person. Oh, yeah? Exactly. Look at Just me. Wait. Hold it down. We'll get the you eventually. She's engaged to an ento, so it's all good. Yeah. All Resistance right. is futile. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're almost out of time, Phil, but uh, besides the PhD coming up, what else do you got coming down the pipe? Do you have anything new and exciting you want uh, to let anybody know about? Um, I'm working on a, uh, a TV show with Al Jazeera right now. Um, cool. So a lot of people in the U.S. don't understand Al Jazeera, but it's a very good news organization, and they do some really good work, and they're doing a science show that's about oh. science innovation, and it's by scientists. So it's me and some other people who are active in the science field, and we go out and we find... Um, cool stories about uh, how science is influencing humans, and I'm uh, doing my best to bring in some bug stories into that. Um, <laughs> everything I recommend, I'm like, hey, how about this thing over there? <laughs> this is um, Good job. But, uh, so I'm yeah. working on that, and that'll start airing in September, um, which will be fun. Cool. A, a cool way to uh, get the word out on some interesting science, and I'll be able to still work on that as I'm getting my PhD. So. That's cool. That's I love awesome. it. I love that like a science show done by scientists is a novelty. I know. <laughs> you right? know like, I can't believe it. Which is why I was I was so happy to hear when they, they talked to me about this. I was like, yes, please, let's do this. <laughs> it needs to be done. Awesome. Well, I know I, for one, am, am much looking forward to seeing what uh, mm -hmm. the future holds for you, Phil. Uh, I think you've got a big career ahead of you, both within the science realm and in the, the pop science realm. So uh, good luck with everything that you're coming up. I can't wait to see the show, and uh, I can't wait to follow along. So where can we find your information, and where can people follow along with your adventures? Um, I'd say Twitter is the best way. It's Phil, <coughs> Phil underscore Torres, and then my blog is therevscience.com, R-E-V science.com. So, uh, yeah, those are probably the best ways. And thank you so much for having me, guys. It was awesome being able to meet all you guys who I've seen on Twitter. And <laughs> it was our pleasure. Thanks for coming on and talking to us. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So this has been uh, episode 35 of the Breaking Bio podcast. You can find us online at breakingbio.com or on Twitter at Breaking Bio. Uh, we we'll hope you join us next time when we talk to somebody new and fascinating. Actually, next time I think might be Christy Wilcox, where we're going to be talking about science communication and potentially lionfish. So join us next week. Uh, until then, have a good week. Bye. 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 <laughs>